We're going to go over to John chapter 12. So if you've got your Bibles, your iPhones, iPads, and Androids, I think, have Bible apps on them too. I'm, I'm not sure I don't own one, but just kidding. Yeah, so John chapter 12, and we'll read some scripture here, and then we're just going to kind of launch and see where, where the Lord wants to go. It's going to be good, because God is good. I just love those testimonies, by the way. Wow. I mean, you know, and that's, God wants to use each one of us that way. That's, that's the beauty of it. So, all right, here we go. John chapter 12, we'll just start at verse 1. Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus, who had been dead, lived, whom he had raised from the dead. And there they made him supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those that sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil, spikenard, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The whole house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. But one of his disciples, Jesus, or Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, whom betrayed him, said, Why? Why this kind of waste? Why wasn't this fragrant oil sold for a 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And he had the money box and used to take it whenever he felt like it. But Jesus said, let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. For the poor you will always have, but me, you not always. And so what I want to talk about today is really just this idea of, of extravagant worship. This idea, what's it really worth? What's he really worth to you and me as the king of kings? And so, so we see Mary here, and I, I want to back up a little bit. Then in Luke chapter 10, it, it gives us a whole another account that when Jesus had come to Bethany, and there was just something special about this place, Bethany, because Jesus, we see several times that he would actually stop there on his way to Jerusalem. And this is where his friends were. I mean, not that his disciples weren't his friends, but there was something real unique, real special with, with Mary and Martha and Lazarus. They, they were friends. And he loved to just come hang out with them and spend time with them. And, and, and the ministry wasn't, wasn't so much ministry as it was just he liked being in the presence of his friends. Do you know God actually likes the very same thing? He likes to be in the presence of his friends. He likes to be in your presence. That if you said yes to Christ and he's your Lord and Savior, guess what? He likes to be in your presence. And if you haven't said yes to Jesus, what? guess what? You were created in his image and he still likes to be in your presence because he likes you a lot. I mean, that's just the cool thing right there. So this idea that Jesus comes to Bethany, and, and even Bethany was kind of interesting because Bethany was, was a place where he would come, and it was like, always like a place of retreat, a place of relaxing, a place of refreshing. But it's also the place that Jesus actually, were, that's where his ascension was. And Bethany is about, about a, about a two-mile journey from, from Jerusalem. So it's like literally, literally just outside the city. And it's right across the, the, the Mount of Olives, actually on the, right on the backside of the Mount of Olives. If you've never been to Israel, I, go. You just need to go sometime. There. What's that? Another trip. We'll, we'll go there too as a family. Wouldn't that be fun? We all just go together. Yeah. Anyway. But, but it is. I mean, it, 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 Israel is such an amazing place. And just, it, I mean, the word comes to life in a fresh way. And, you know, it's interesting. I, I, there was this one girl that we met actually from, from Bethany. Actually, we met th- this girl and her brother. But this, this girl... She had uh, actually been diagnosed with cancer. And I mean, not very old either. You know, I think it was le- leukemia is what she actually had. And, you know, the doctors would only give her a certain period of time to live. And, and during this time, actually, her, her mom and her brother and some other family members got saved. But she, she didn't want anything to do with Jesus because she was angry at God. And she didn't even know if there was a God because the reality is she was suffering with this sickness. And I remember as she was sharing her testimony, she was like, and she was just so full of hatred and so full of bitterness that one day she goes to Hamas. And goes, I want to blow up some Jews. I want to blow up people. And so like literally, she was on a mission to go bring destruction. But every day her mom would come to her. It's like, All right, come here. Let's, I'm going to pray for you. She goes, stop praying for me. I don't want your prayers. I don't believe in God. I don't believe that even exists. And she was just so full of hatred and bitterness. And yet, one night when she went to sleep, she just said a real simple thing. 
I'm not going to pray to Allah. I'm not going to pray to Jesus. I'm going to pray to the God that created me. If you're real, you can heal me. I believe it. And so literally she goes to sleep. And as she was sleeping, in the middle of the night, Jesus appears to her, puts his hand on her chest, and literally heals her. She wakes up completely healed. And she knew it was Jesus because it was the man in white. It's, I mean, really, the testimonies that we've heard even firsthand from people of the man in white show, showing himself to Muslims is, is astounding. And that's what God is doing. And it comes from the simple place because he's, he's drawing a people in this day and this hour. But if from that point on, this girl actually literally all of a sudden just began to worship Jesus. And like the hatred that she had for the Jewish people, the hatred that she had for Christians, all of that was removed in a moment because she'd actually seen the man that created her for friendship and for relationship. She was compelled by that reality to love. And it's interesting, even the, the word Bethany, it's got a couple different meanings. It, it means either the, 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 the house of affliction or the house of bitterness. It's also known as the house of song. But this idea that, that this girl, that in this place, that in the, in the middle of her uh, uh, affliction, God would reach down and touch her in the middle of the night, in a dream, in a vision, and actually bring healing to her. I mean, it's amazing. This is what God is doing. You know, sometimes we, we, we confine God to, to, to the word that's uh, just the, the, the pages that are there, and we don't actually see that actually it's living and it's active. Like, God is alive today, right now. And he's just looking for friends. Just looking for friends. Now, about two years later, we, we were in, in Jerusalem, and we were actually at a, there's a really cool house of prayer that overlooks uh, uh, Mount Zion, which is, it's like a real place, you know what I mean? And like when you're when you're prayer leading, I mean, because we come sometimes, and you're literally looking at Mount Zion. I mean, it just it's just so cool, you know. And you're just you're praying, and you're interceding, and just. But there was this one gentleman that had come in uh, that night, and he was like dragging his leg. And I thought, oh. And we were sharing during one of their main gatherings, and as he came across the room, I thought, God's going to heal that guy. So I said, I said like three different times as I was preaching the message, I said, God's going to heal you. I didn't even know what was wrong with him. And at the end of the time, actually, Elizabeth and I began to pray for this guy. What had happened is that the, the, the tendon that connects, like, the hamstring, you know, that lets you do this, was, was severed. So literally, he, there was no way to bend his leg. I know, right. It's just nasty. I mean, like, you could actually feel the, the muscle rolled up. You know what I mean? It was just, it was kind of nasty. But, and he was supposed to go in for surgery like, I think this was on a Monday night. I think Thursday he was supposed to go in for surgery. And so Elizabeth and I just start praying for him. And we just began to speak and release healing into this guy. And all of a sudden, God totally heals it. And like all of a sudden, he's going, this is crazy. I mean, like, and he's like freaking out. And he starts running around the room, just testing it out. And he's like, wow, the doctors are not going to believe this. And I said, well, you know who to give credit to. Well, the cool thing is that this guy was actually the brother who had prayed for his sister the one that had the encounter, and they're both from this place of Bethany. I don't know, it just, it just God is so cool that way. He really is. And so now, we, we, now we've got Jesus. Now, he, there he is in Bethany, and he's with his friends. He's with, he's with Martha. He's with Mary. He's with Lazarus. And, you know, there's this, there's this meal. And I like it because it says that in, in, the, in the Message Bible, it says that they, they actually honored Jesus. They created this amazing supper, this environment, this atmosphere, because it was just before the Passover as they were going to head into Jerusalem. And so Jesus was the honored guest. And there he was, sitting with his friends at the table eating. And at one point, you know, it says that, says that Martha served. And, and Martha was serving. And it's so different than, than, than the, the previous count that we actually see Martha serving in. That in, in Luke chapter 10 where we see Martha's in the kitchen and she's busy about all kinds of stuff. And she's ah, nah, 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 trying to make sandwiches that Jesus never ordered. And she's doing all kinds of things. And then she sees her sister sitting at the feet of Jesus. I mean, I mean, just sitting there at the feet of Jesus, gazing, listening to every word, her heart being awakened and made alive. And she just listened intently. She was drawn in to his heart. She was pulled in. She was becoming one with the man Christ Jesus. She chose to worship, and Martha, in her whining and complaining and her worry and concern, says, come on, Jesus, tell her to help me. Yeah, because that's how she talked. 
But yet, Jesus kind of looked at Martha and said, Martha, and you're, you're so worried about so many things. And see, that was the key thing he was really trying to address was the issue of worry and anxiousness. It wasn't the fact that she was serving, but it was the way that she was going about the serving. Like somehow trying to prove God's love and affection by the things that she was doing. You know, and there's many of us that are like that. I mean, and see, God loves people that serve. God loves the Marthas. God loves the ones that do things because the doers get things done. But if we, if we strive after the doing first and we do, 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 you know what do-do is? I mean, that's right. But God's calling us to, to do from a place of being. And see, that's, that's where Martha was completely contrary to that. And the sister sat at the feet of Jesus and just gazed and beheld the goodness of the Father, the goodness of, of the Son, the overwhelming grace and presence of Holy Spirit that was just emanating from Jesus. And so she worshipped. She was compelled because she had an encounter she stopped and made herself still for a moment. And she saw. And I believe that's an invitation for all of us, that God is, is just inviting us into this place of extravagant worship and this place where, where what would we do to grab a hold of his presence? What would we do to, to truly worship him in spirit and in truth? What would we do? What would we be willing to give? For him, the one that's been found worthy, the Lamb of God, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Again, from that place of being, we can do. And we've got all kinds of stuff that has to be done, I assure you. I mean, because Jesus even said, you know, pray to the Lord of the harvest that he might send labors into the field. What well, labor? That means you're doing something. You know, faith without works is dead. But it's got to come from that place of, of, of a connected heart, of, of being fascinated with the beauty of who Christ is. That awakens a reality to what's inside of you, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And, and there's something he wants to awaken in each of our hearts today that we, we, we really see what's on the inside, and it's him. It's him. He's jealous for you. He's jealous for your affection. He's jealous for your time. Yeah, but I don't have the time. You do. Worship him in all things, even in your homework. Da, 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 da. <laughs> Worship while you work. You know, it's amazing that when, when, you, when you give God just that morsel, he just causes everything just to fall in line. And there's something about that, that priority, that when we make him the priority, that he really becomes the first thing in our life. I mean, even when in, in Matthew chapter 22, even when the, you know, they were really trying to catch him in something like, oh, Jesus, what is the first and greatest commandment? You know, and there's that, that annoying, just religious thing. And Jesus said, hey, it's like this. Love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And the second's like it, just love your neighbor as yourself. And this idea that it, it all comes down in, to that one simple thing of love. And you see, and, and, and the thing is, it's, it's not love like you and I know love. It's, it's this unfailing reality of perfect love. Like it says in 1 John chapter 3, it said, Behold of what manner of love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. There's a lavishing dimension. Wasteful, actually, is what lavish means. To be wasteful. That God, in his kindness and goodness, wastefully poured his love. It wasn't waste to him, though. I mean, the world many times will say, why the waste? Why would you do that? Why would you spend time in a prayer room? Why would you come to church on Sunday? There's so many things that we need to do. You know, Packers around. You know, I, mean, oh, I, I got studies I got to do. But there's something that when we literally bring that priority and that alignment in our lives where we make Jesus the goal, where we make him the priority, of just being fascinated with his beauty, fascinated with his glory, fascinated with his grace. 
everything just comes into alignment. And so we see this, 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 this reality going on in the house. That, that, that this time, Martha, when she's serving, it's coming out of a place where she actually understands who she is because she spent time with Jesus now. She, she's listening to him saying, you know what? Your sister's chosen the better. And I believe that she didn't say, oh, yeah, whatever. No, I, th- I believe, you know what? She began to practice his presence. I believe that she began to sit at Jesus' feet in the same way. The fact is now that she was serving and compelled out of this place of worship. And it's that when, even when we look at Lazarus, it says that, and Lazarus was sitting at the table with Jesus. Now, the dude was dead just a few days ago. I mean, that's pretty crazy stuff right there. I mean, his literal presence sitting at the table was a witness testifying of God's amazing power and grace. You know, and witnessing isn't always about saying stuff. And in fact, it wasn't the fact that he was even witnessing at all. It was the fact that he was being a witness. Because that's actually what it says in Acts 1.8. And you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. It doesn't say, you should, and you shall go witness. See, witness is the doing part, but being a witness is a reality of identity. And see, God is looking for witnesses. And literally, as Lazarus was sitting at the table, I mean, his life, his life, the fact that he was dead and now he's alive again, his life was speaking volumes. It's interesting because if we scroll down a little bit further in that chapter, it says, and the Pharisees made a plot and a plan how they might kill Lazarus. I'm going, the dude was already dead. You don't think Jesus could do that again? I mean, it's just so random. And so this idea that we see, we see that, that from the place of worship, there's a, there's a serving dimension that, 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 that uh, Martha moves into. And then from that place of worship and adoration and understanding who Christ is, we see, we see Lazarus' life being a witness. And next we come to the, to the third sibling, and it's Mary. And Mary just, she, again, she just had something with the feet of Jesus. I mean, she loved being at the feet of Jesus. There was just something about being in his presence, and she, she just wanted to give it all because she saw the worth that was in the man. She saw the worth and the reality of who Christ said he was even during those three and a half years. I mean, the disciples couldn't get it, but she understood and saw something that the others didn't see. The fact that she would even on this day, it says that, that as, as she came and she was holding that, that alabaster box, I mean, a pound of anointing oil. And see, in, in some commentaries it said that it was actually probably her dowry, meaning that was the very thing that she was to give to the husband because it was worth a year's wages. It was literally part of her inheritance. What she was doing is she was literally giving away her inheritance. She was giving away the gift that was to be given to a husband. She was giving it all away because she saw the one that was in front of her. And she just said, I'm going to pour it out. And she broke that alabaster box, that jar, and just began to anoint the feet of Jesus. This place of of worship, this place of, of giving it all. She saw the worth of Jesus, and she just poured it out, and poured it out, and poured it out. And you know what? God is awakening the hearts of sons and daughters in this day and this hour that are just going to be willing to pour it out, to pour it out, to pour it out. He's asking you today, will you be willing to pour it out, to pour it out, to pour it? Just give it all. Give it all the way. Because how many of us in here want more of God? Five people want more of God. This is a really good group. I'm kidding. I know you all do. But in Matthew chapter 10, it says that as you go, preach the gospel of the kingdom, heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, cast out demons, freely receive and freely give it away. If you want more of God, you've got to give away what you have. There's something about that. Giving away what you have. And Mary... Mary counted the cost, kind of, meaning she was like, but he's so worthy. He's so worth it. 
I, I, of course I'm going to do this. And, and then it says that, that as she anointed his feet, it just began to massage his feet in this reality because she knew something in the spirit that Jesus was about to, to go on this journey where no other man had gone before. He was about to go on a journey that would literally bring you and I into a place that we could say yes and amen, that we're going to live forever. She saw something in the realm of the spirit, I believe, that in that place of sitting at his feet, the father began to share secrets with her because she was a friend of God. That she began to see what was about to take place just a few days from then. Where Jesus literally would die. He would be crucified. He would be hung on a cross, humiliated, beaten, bruised, unrecognizable. She saw that and said, he's, he's worth it. He's worthy of it all. He's so worth it. He's worthy of it all. And she poured that oil, that ointment. And see, I mean, it was a costly, 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 costly perfume. 300 denaria. I mean, that's, I mean, Judas, he's like, why this waste? Well, again, why, why not? Behold what manner of love the Father has wastefully poured on us. She got a glimpse. She got a glimpse of a lavish love that would never fail, that would never fade. She saw. She beheld love. See, love isn't a feeling and emotion in this sense. Love is a person, the man Christ Jesus. And she was so enthralled by the beauty of who he was, and he was so enthralled by the beauty of who she was, and this act of worship as she poured out her life upon, her inheritance upon, this, 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 this uh, offering. You know, and the, and the spike nard, I mean, the, the, that aloe, that, all of that stuff mixed together, actually was, was the anointing oil they used on kings. And, and it came from India. It came from the Far East. It came from India. It was actually one of those really costly, costly things. And it's because he was given some of that as a, as a king. We see that actually in Song of Songs, where it makes reference to this, that, that this was the anointing oil of kings. And so she saw something that others didn't see as she worshipped. See, that's the key to it. You want to see things? You want to know things that are deep in the heart of God? Just begin to worship. Begin to carve out those times when you're walking to class. Take out the earbuds for a minute and just listen for the voice of the Father. You want to hear the voice of God? When you're driving in the car, just turn the radio off and just listen for the voice of the Father. He wants to speak. He's always speaking. The key is... We just need to be listening. And we can hear the voice of God, by the way. How many people in here are, are saved and have received Jesus as the Lord and Savior? So everyone that's got their hands, you've heard the voice of God. It was his voice. It was his kindness that brought you to a place where you could actually understand how much he loves you. So Mary pours it out. And right away, Judas is so critical. Why this waste? Why not? I mean, what's he worth? He was able to right in a moment tally up, that's 300 denarii right there. That's 300 pieces of silver. I mean, he was quite a businessman. Actually, his name, uh, Judas Iscariot, actually means Judas the locksmith. It wasn't a city that he was from. It was actually uh, a trade that his family actually functioned in. And Jesus held keys, or uh, Judas held keys, and Jesus held keys. Judas held the keys to the, to the money box. It says that he was actually a thief, and he would pull off what he took what he wanted and wanted. But he also had keys. He held keys that he could have chosen which way direction to go. But in his harshness and his inability to see the true worth of Jesus. And see, that's the key there is that Mary saw the worth of Jesus and Judas did not see the worth of Jesus. He knew the worth of the oil, but he didn't know the worth of the man that was in front of him. And this idea of extravagant worship and a lifestyle of worship. You know, a worshiper isn't someone that just plays an instrument. A worshiper is literally what God has called each one of us to that have said yes to Jesus. And he's just looking for the yes. He's looking for the want to. Do you want to? Do you want to love him with all your heart? Do you want to love him with all your soul? Do you want to love him with all your strength? 
And you know, it's just baby steps. It really is. It's just baby steps. Each day, that as we take those steps towards him, and we move towards him. You know, it's interesting that, that even as, as Judas betrays Jesus, I mean, he understood the, the, the value of the spike nard but didn't understand the value of love and what Jesus was about to do. The fact that, you know, he went in for 30 pieces of silver. He sold the king out. And then he realized, I mean, we hear him say that, oh, what have I done? I've like, I literally betrayed. I have innocent blood here. What have I done? And he goes and hangs himself on a tree. And the reality is that Jesus is about to do the same thing so that he could live again. Took things in his own hands rather than placing his life in the hands of a king, a trustworthy one, one that was anointed. Even as Mary anointed those feet, I mean, you know, like in the the book of uh, Esther, it's just like they went through these treatments where they were like saturated in uh, oils and perfumes and all kinds of stuff for like a year. To the point where they, I mean, literally, they, everything about them smelled like that fragrance. Because, see, that's what was going on in that room. It says that the whole room was filled with the fragrance. It was filled with that fragrance, that spice, that, that expensive perfume from India. It filled the whole room. And I believe that even as Jesus made his way into Jerusalem, his feet anointed for the journey that he was set out before him. And it was, it was about the burial because, see, because Mary saw this reality. She saw something different. She saw something new. That as, as Jesus made his journey back into the city, and that as he stood before those that would condemn him to death, I can imagine just the fragrance being released from his feet. I mean, could you imagine being the Roman dude that nailed his feet that all of a sudden, and all of a sudden this fragrance just gets released? Because Mary was willing to lay it down. Her fragrant offering went all the way to the cross. And God is looking for worshipers. You know, it says in John chapter 4 that the Father is seeking and searching for worshipers that will worship him in spirit and in truth. Again, it's about a lifestyle. It's about just that baby step, taking those steps towards it. See, because that was Martha's journey. She was busy, busy, busy. But she, when Jesus said, she's chosen a better thing, well, I'm going to try this. I'm going to try this. Thing. This is actually pretty good. Hey, this is actually really good. Man. Can I get you a sandwich now, Jesus? You know what I mean? It's like, it came out of a place of knowing who she was, not about what she did. And too often we draw our identity from the things that we do rather than who we really are. And the fact that we've all been created in God's image to be his friend, to be lovers of the Most High God. Extravagant worship. Are you willing to lay it all down? People might call you a freak. Good. I'm a Jesus freak, and I'm okay with it. I mean, David was a freak. King David. Maybe the David, you're a freak too, David. Just be, be good with it. But King David was a freak. I mean, he knew about the, the presence. He knew about worship, but it all started as a little boy in a field. But it was, it was part of the rhythm of his life. It was part of the rhythm of his journey that even when he was anointed king and he came into that place, he said, I've got to have the ark of the presence. I've got to have it. We've got to bring it back. It's all about his presence. I've got to worship him. Because he knew. He knew the weightiness of God's love. He knew the weightiness of God's presence. He'd experienced it and known it intimately. But he wanted a whole nation to experience that reality, that as they set out, and it says that that even as they came back, there was 30,000 men, I mean, worshiping, and they were sacrificing just to get the presence back in the city. It says that even as David, he was was dancing. (sighs) 
in his undies, and I'm not going to get in mine. But he was dancing in his underwear, his, his undergarments, the linen ephod, the fact he was making a fool of himself. That Even as he came into the city, his wife saw him and said, what is with this guy? You looked ridiculous out there, David. And it says that she was barren from that day on. Never bore a kid. Oh, that's what happens. Be a freak, and you'll be fruitful. Because he's worth it. What's he worth to you? What's he worth to you? Would you be willing to give him five minutes a day? Five minutes more? Would you be willing to give him an hour more? He loves. He loves. He loves. See, there's nothing you can do to get him to love you more. That even as, as Mary just poured that out, Jesus already loved her deeply. It didn't change the dimension and depths of love that he, he had for her. But it, 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 it awakened something like, oh, there's a whole generation that's going to be like Mary. There's a whole generation that's going to be like David. And they're not going to care what the people think. They're just going to be whoosh, extravagant in the way that they pour their lives out before the king. And it will look different for every one of us. That even as, as Jeffrey's heading out to Los Angeles, I mean, he's leaving. He's leaving here. He's leaving the reality of home. He's leaving even just the big pay from a, from a job. And, you know, but God's going to reward him because he's just willing to be obedient. You know, that, that's really the deal. It really is. It's listening and obeying. Listening to the sweetness of his love. Again, behold what manner of love the Father has lavished so wastefully poured upon you that you can be called a child of God. And he wants children to come back to a place where they understand that you're loved, that you're embraced. You're not forsaken. You're not forgotten. He knows you. He created you. Truly, he created you. He wants to bring you in a place where you really understand his, his love for you. And then in response, like Mary, because she, she grabbed a hold of that love, it's like from that place, it motivated her heart just to give it all. And that's what God wants, wants each of us to do, just give him another portion. He wants us just to, to pour out our lives upon him, our song, our our, our poem, our, our lives. You guys are so amazing. You've been set apart for this time. You're alive in this window of time. And God has marked each one of you to do great things. But it's it's from that place of worship. It's from that place of extravagance. It's from that place of just understanding that he will carry you all along the way. That from that place of worship, you'll serve him in a way that you've never known before. From that place of worship, you'll be his witness. From that place of worship, you're just going to keep pouring it out. See, just one touch of his love changes everything. He's a good father. He's a good God. He's the one true God that has marked every one of you for greatness. And there's a hope and a future that he wants you all to grab a hold of today. He's got amazing plans for you. Plans to prosper you, not harm you. Plans to prosper you, not harm you. He's a good father who's really good. And he's, he's just looking for ones that would just be obedient. Not, not obedience out of this place of like, oh, he's going to smash me and crush me if I don't. It comes from this place going, wow, I can't help myself. I mean, I, wow. You, you, you uh, all of a sudden, you begin to see the reality of why you were created. All of a sudden, you get to be part of what he's doing. 
you're invited into the story to write the story so that others can read the story. Every one of you has a place in the story. Every one of you. He just wants you to hear. He created you for an amazing destiny. He created you for his good pleasure. And it's my prayer today that you would just, that you would see. That you would see the, the hope and the reality of the why you live. That you'd see the hope and the reality of, of, of just God's goodness. Because he wants to take you to the higher place. He wants to take you up so you see from his perspective. And he's just looking for just obedient friends. He's looking for burning hearts. See, it takes oil to cause fire in a, in a candle or in a lampstand to burn. And I believe he's raising up a generation that that are so compelled by the first commandment is to love God completely with all that they are so that they can effectively do the second and that's serving and, and loving the community that's around us. It's, it's a byproduct of, of relationship. It's a byproduct and an outflow of just spending time in His presence, just taking those times to see Him as He really is, that He really is good, and He's got good things planned for you. You know, the world paints God in such an awful picture. I mean, they're even calling these hurricanes acts of God. No, they're not acts of God. Can I just declare that? They're not acts of God. There's winds of change that are blowing. Creation is groaning so that you and I would be made manifest. He's not trying to teach people a lesson by bringing calamity and judgment. Do you know that sickness is not a way that he teaches people how to do things? Disease is not, oh, God must be teaching me something in this. No, he's not. Not that you can't learn something from your ailments and sickness, but God is not the causer of it because his name is healer. Not only is his name healer, it's actually his character and his nature, and how could he be against himself? Because even Jesus said, a house divided against itself can't even stand. I mean, why would God send affliction to teach you something? It'd be the same thing if I went to my daughter Elizabeth. Come here, honey, let me break your arm. I just need to teach you something. I don't know what, but you'll learn something from this, I'm sure. I mean, think of how re wrong that is. I'd be thrown in jail, actually. Our Father's not abusive. The Father is love. That's who He is. He is love. And He loves you with an everlasting love. He loves you with this, this, this wasteful outpouring of love. He's a good Father. It's a good Father. You know, and, and yes, God can take all those things that have come against us from the dark enemy, and He turns all those things into good, and He just uses it to just... I mean, the testimonies that were shared, to me, it's in the face of the enemy. That in the midst of our pain, in the midst of our affliction. God can use all things if we just see how he sees. And if we approach him with the posture that he's good always. Because he is. He is. He's really, like good all the time. He's full of love. And he loves you deeply. Every one of you have been so uniquely created. so uniquely created. It's no coincidence or mistake that anyone is here today. God appointed this time because he loves you. And he just wants you to hear this, that he loves you with the same intensity of love that he loves his son, Jesus. That's the kind of love he has for you right now. 
even in the midst of the things that may be going on, the trials and, and just even maybe some sin that you stumbled into or willfully chose to do. You know what? He still loves you. And he just wants you to see his kindness. He wants you to hear his kindness. He wants you to feel his kindness because that's what's going to cause you to change your mind. That's what's going to cause you to change your heart to see him as he really is. He's good. He's so good. And from that place of extravagance, all of a sudden, we just begin to serve God in a fresh way. We serve him as an outflow. And then we can just be his witness. I mean, in our workplace, in our classrooms, we just radiate the goodness of Jesus. St. Francis of Assisi said, preach the gospel at all times. Use words when necessary. See, it's about being a witness, not always talking. People are watching. And they see something different, that when you've encountered light, light all of a sudden begins to be a very part of your fabric, very part of your being. He loves you. Not disappointed, by the way. He's not disappointed at all. He's just wooing. Saying, hey, how would you like to go on an adventure? How would you like to enter into a, a journey of a lifetime? I just want us to get in a posture just to receive, just from the Father, okay? Can we do that? You can stand up, you can sit down, you can get on your knees, you can do whatever you want, but I just, I just want us to get in a posture to receive, just receive more of Him. And Lord, I just I declare that You were good. I declare that you were, you were for each one in this room because You created them in Your image. I just say, God, would you let the, the reality of hope just infuse each heart in this place? God, that you'd flood them, that you'd fill them. That even as the world might look at them as, as freaks and extravagant, God, you say, I'm so pleased. I'm so pleased. I'm so pleased. I love you. I love you. I love you, my son. I love you. I love you, my daughter. Do you see who you are? Do you see what I see? Do you see what I see? Do you see what I see? amazing. You're amazing. Even before we go any further, I just, I just want to give an invitation. If, if you're here today, and you, know, you, you had a friend that brought you, and you're like, well, I'm even here. Because God loves you. That's why you're here. He makes these appointments. Sometimes we don't even understand that we're like right in the thing. And I just want to give an opportunity today. If, if you've never confessed Jesus as King and as Lord of your life, if you've never believed in what, what He completely finished for you and received this amazing free gift of salvation, that just makes your heart happy, that sets your heart free. If, if that's you today, I, I, I just want to give an opportunity for you just to say yes. Because he sees you. He loves you. If that's you today, I just, I just want you to stick a hand up because I want to pray. If that's you today, if you just want to receive Jesus as your, as your Savior and as your King, I just want to pray for you. I just want to pray for you. God, I just thank you for each one in here. That you'd continue just to reveal the goodness of God to us. That as we take those baby steps towards deeper places of intimacy and worship, God, that you would meet us with the reality of, of you are for us and not against us. 
But God, as we take those baby steps, you would just, you would set our hearts free that we could step into the reality of why we've been created, that we would see the destiny, that we would see the future, that we would see the hope, God, that you're calling us into with an eager expectation of coming good. That we would know the goodness of the Lord right now in the land of the living. That you bring us into a fresh encounter with your heart. That religious mindsets, religious ways would fall to the wayside, that we would enter into deeper dimensions of relationship with this uncreated God that created us each for his pleasure. There's no God like you anywhere. Father, I just ask that you just release and unlock your heart today. That you release and unlock, God, just the plans that you have for each one in this room. I thank you, Papa, that you're mindful of each one. Send them forth this week, God, as a smooth stone to bring down the giants that would cross their paths. Again, I declare that you are good, Papa. 